And um, yeah, I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, today's TSA Africa Partnerships and Outreach Working Group. Um, we have a co-chair on the call, Aliki. So Aliki, if you don't mind, you can enable your camera for people to see your beautiful face. <laughs> Hello everyone, so excited to be here and uh, yeah, very excited to be co-chair. Uh, thanks for letting me join the team. Great. Um, before we start, please feel free to put in the chat your name and your institution that you're affiliated with. Um, we don't have the time for each person to kind of unmute and provide um, an introduction of ourselves, so we will do that via the chat. And then we will kind of compile all the responses that we have. I am not sure if Amit is on the call, my, my co-partner in crime, but then probably he will join later. Okay, so to just give you an overview of the DS Africa Partnership and Arctic Working Group, um, this working group comprises of DS Africa concession members and non-DS Africa concession members. So we are very open. We have um, people from research institutions, from industry, from um, yeah, other um, organizations participating in, in, um, in the working group. Some of the major activities that we do is um, the networking initiative, which um, most of you on this call have participated on before. Okay, so without much I do, I'll just give an update of um, some of the upcoming activities of the consortium. So um, we have our fourth virtual networking exchange activity, which is scheduled for September 20th. We have shared a calendar holder with everyone, but then um, the registration is not yet open. Um, hopefully by the end of the week, we will open registration and then communications will be sent to you all. Another major activity of the consortium is the DSI Africa consortium meeting, um, which is scheduled for November, the first week of November, and it's happening in, in Rwanda. So, um, more information about this will also be communicated. For now, I'll just hand over to Amid. Um, he has a short minute poll that he wants to organize. Then, after we just zoom straight to the presentation. So we have um, Amit, feel free. Yeah, hi, thanks Francis and apologies. I've had some uh, internet issues on my end. Um, I hope I'm coming through clearly. Just, I, I think Francis, you covered, I think we'll skip the Mentimeter poll and, and just go right into um, today's session. I just wanna thank everyone again for joining today um, and a reminder that this group is open to anyone outside the consortium. So please feel free to share um, the announcement with other people uh, at your institutions that might be interested. And um, we're really, the, the goals of this group are really one to help create opportunities for networking, for you to meet people that could become your partners. Um, and then second, also to create a forum to have some you're, discussions. Uh, you're, you're breaking up there a little bit. I... So, apologies, I'll turn off the camera and I hope this helps. Um, I was just saying that the goals of this group are one, to create opportunities for you to meet each other, identify potential partners, and two, to um, create a forum to discuss the challenges to partnership and kind of brainstorm and share strategies and uh, lessons learned on the field of partnerships. I'll stop there. I'll hand it back to uh, Francis or Michelle to take it from here. Thank you all. Awesome. Thanks so much, um, Francis. And I mean, Francis, is there anything else you want to mention? Is, is that fine? Uh, no. I, don't, I don't, I think uh, we lost Skylar for a minute there. Um, so I'm just going to talk to a few points and hopefully you can join. Ah, there we go. So, yeah. So thanks so much. Um, so I just wanted to say that, um, you know, the support for this partnerships and networking is really fundamental, is really a fundamental part of the DSI Africa initiative. And it's really been nurtured by a meet, which you just saw now on the call, and the NIH DSI Africa um, team. They really laid a great foundation for us. And we we moving forward with this, you know, this foundation through the um 
the partnerships and outreach group, the work that they've done initially when setting up the DSI initiative. So um, through us actively engaging part, um, stakeholders through these various events, um, these networking events that we've held, we've held online and in person, we've also uh, reached out to individuals and organizations through video calls. So just having like those one-on-one -on -one conversations to invite people or to invite them to join the um to, to, to join the face-to-face -face network meeting. So we've we've been actively engaging um, the stakeholders interested in data science or involved in data science. Um, yeah, so through these engagements um, and feedbacks, we, we often do a, a feedback evaluation. Um, we've gotten feedback that, you know, developing partnerships is quite challenging. And um, that is why we started this um, series of, um, discussions around challenges around partnerships. Um, so yeah, so we would like to demystify that and support people more. And we're fortunate today to be able to have two, two great speakers with us. Um, um, I think many of you may know Skyler Speakman, and he's a senior research scientist um, and manager at IBM Research in Nairobi. Um, he really develops methods um, for detecting um, anon an anonymous um, <laughs> sorry, um, patterns in data science and models. And he uses this then to make uh, machine learning models more robust and explainable and fair. Uh, he received his PhD from Carnegie Mellon University in um, 2014. And we're also fortunate to have with us today um, Charity Wayu. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your surname correctly, but you can you can um, correct me later. Um, she's the director of IBM Research uh, with the key um, um, research sites in Nairobi, Kenya, and of course Johannesburg, South Africa. She's been part of IBM Research for the past ten years, and so that that's quite great. Um, she also is involved in, of course, the projects that span government, nonprofits, academia, and she received her PhD um, from the University of Purdue. So, um, yeah, so it's exactly that. Those 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 various types of um, partnerships between sort of academia, there's the the nonprofits, there's government, there's um, philanthropists. So so we look forward to what. Um, Skyla and Charity can share with us today, and they will be talking about experiences with partnerships from IBM Research and DSI Africa. So thanks so much for joining us, and please go ahead. All right, can you all hear me? Yeah, we can. All right, great. Uh, let me share screens. There we go. Uh, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introductions. Um, repeating it again, my name is Skyler, and I'm a research scientist based in Nairobi, Kenya. However, today I'm I'm back uh, in Indiana in the U.S. visiting uh, cousins and grandparents, etc. So that's what uh, that's what the bright sun outside ha um, above me today is is from. I'm also joined by Charity, who I think she's on the call. Charity, can you give a quick shout out if you are? If not, I think she's joining shortly. Um, yes, I am. Oh, great. Uh, and so uh, Charity is the director of IBM Research Africa, and um, she's going to, I think, take the second half that she's going to really specialize in the question and answer session. Um, she has been studying what I would call kind of the, the business of research in Africa. How do you really motivate you know multiple entities to come together and try to address these questions and so she's been doing that for nearly 10 years uh and so i really hope that you all have some great questions um um either they're coming coming from this short uh powerpoint presentation or you already had some in mind so uh charity's gonna really field some of those questions at the end but first i wanted to take you through a little bit of history of ibm research ibm research africa and some of the projects that we've done with external partners to give a flavor of maybe things that worked really well uh, and in some cases maybe things uh, that didn't work out um, so please i think at the very very end i don't have the slide that says questions with a question mark um, we are actively telling you you had better ask questions by the end of this 
Uh, so to start out, IBM Research from a global perspective, before we get down to the Africa Lab, um, IBM Research is one of the longest industrial research, the longest uh, living industrial research institutions in the world. Uh, and we have two major mandates as set by the larger IBM company. First, research is supposed to be the organic growth engine of IBM. There's lots of different ways to grow a company and mergers and acquisitions is one way, but research from within IBM is meant to be the one that spins up new ideas and says to the business, this should be an area the business should be moving forward to. All right, this is the, you know, the opinions and the research of the scientists that study this space. We think this is a really cool area for the company to move into. And so that's what we mean by being the organic growth engine of the larger multinational entity known as IBM. The second mandate for research is to make IBM synonymous with the term future of computing, right? So IBM really wants to position itself as this tech partner that balances a bit of consulting, but also this fundamental advances in things such as AI, quantum, cloud, and semiconductors. So those four areas fall under what uh, the, the research has described, the future of computing. And uh, some very broad, exciting topics there. Uh, two of those are something we actively take a strong research role within IBM Research Africa. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of set a baseline here of how the larger IBM business institution views the role of their research labs spanning the globe. We've got uh, research labs on almost every continent now except Antarctica. Um, and IBM Research Africa has two locations, one in Nairobi, Kenya, and one in Johannesburg. So that's the, the larger, very quick dive of why IBM Research exists in general. So why did IBM Research Africa come to be? Well. About 10 years ago, um, the first industrial research lab on the continent was set up in Nairobi, Kenya. And our goal was to address Africa's grand challenges. And so it was, it was an exciting time. We had, we had this kind of shotgun approach to Africa's grand challenges. It's been said that Africa has been blessed with lots of problems to solve. Right? And you can see this list here of um, all of these different areas that we had projects in. Some were completely internal, some were external. Uh, now, if any of you have been kind of been doing research for a longer period of time, you're probably looking at that list and you're saying there's a problem with it. And um, at the time, we were too young and perhaps too naive to understand what the problem was. Does anyone know what the problem is with this list? You can feel free to unmute yourself. Don't be shy. Maybe not embracing partnerships. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, well, that would be a very good question based on today's conversation. Um, uh, so we did have some partnerships that we'll go through the list. Um, but what we found out was this was way too broad. We were not getting enough traction internally within IBM. Um, we would sit down with potential partners and have the list of all these cool things we were doing. Uh, and it was, it was a bit all over the place, right? And so Charity can maybe talk about some of those days more and how we then eventually pivoted to where we are now. And I think we are in a, I'd say in a more competitive spot because we have done a better, better job kind of narrowing down the things that we are working on as a lab within IBM Research Africa. And these areas now, and so uh, these are the areas I wanna say, if you guys are on the call or wondering, uh, you know, what's IBM Research Africa doing now? What do partnerships look like going forward? This second area is now something that's kind of evolved over the course of 10 years. Uh, and these are areas that we are active now in, both within the Africa Lab, and we know that these areas are also aligned with our research labs around the globe and with the larger business unit. So the areas we're working on now are how can we use generative AI to have better climate models, and how do we deploy these climate models for use cases of all sorts of different partners that may come to us. So. We know we're not going to create the next chat GPT, but 
the technology that allows these large language models to work, sometimes called foundation models, are not limited to text. And so we are working on trying to build the best foundation climate models that can then be queried and asked in a similar way you would think of a chatbot, not through language, but through doing these climate models built on a foundation model architecture and deployed under IBM systems. Some of these things are used, um, and I believe one of the NIH projects, HEAT, uh, and we're trying to build this platform that, again, users from around the world would be able to better interact with a climate model. The second area that's going on with IBM Research Africa, and this one is within healthcare specifically, is we are trying to focus all of our efforts on accelerating drug discovery. In particular, drug discovery for perhaps neglected tropical diseases. Uh, so these are diseases that pharma may have looked at in the past and say, actually, it doesn't make financial sense to go after these. But again, through the use cases of generative models, we are able to do the materials or drug discovery process much faster. And so that's what we're emphasizing on the accelerating of the drug discovery process, again, using foundation models. As I mentioned, large language models are not limited to just language. And you can pass in chemical sequences, such as H2O as the smile notation for water. You pass in a few millions of those, and these, uh, these drug discovery models begin to understand the relationships between uh, chemical properties, and then you can tweak and tune from there. So some really exciting work that our Africa-based researchers are a part of as part of a global uh, research project within all of IBM. Third of the on the list is what can we do to actually make large language models more appealing to the enterprise? Uh, so as one of our SVPs recently said, we're not going to be able to compete with the models that write poems about a cat, right? Those, you know, that's kind of, he's making a stab at the chat GPTs. That's amazing technology, what they're able to do. But in the, in the use cases that enterprise and or governments are looking at when they're interacting with citizens or customers, it's a different type of relationship. And so IBM really wants to make sure that we are creating large language models in a principled way such that enterprise uh, customers and or governments can use these things to interact with their clients or citizens in a, uh, in a much more controlled manner. And last but not least, we also have research coming out of the South Africa lab for quantum. And we're trying to build up a, a quantum network where universities and academics can come together and get their hands dirty with um, IBM's quantum technology. So all this slide is to say over the course of 10 years, we've gone from kind of broad and admittedly too broad of areas um, that were probably more viewed as one-offs and harder to incorporate into the larger IBM, even though they were some successful projects, it was hard to incorporate them into the larger business unit. And some of our researchers were uh, wondering where's the impact after we did the project if there's not a follow-up afterwards. And on the second bullet, you can see where now I think we focus this a lot more and we've got a lot better relationships with the larger IBM research across the globe. I do wanna call out last thing on this slide, something that hasn't changed in the course of the 10 years of what IBM Research Africa is doing on the continent, and that is talent. Uh, so we have had so many students come in as interns, you know, uh, after their master's or after their bachelor's and then have gone on to do PhDs. I know we have some leaving uh, in a month or so for their new PhDs. We've got others that have finished their PhDs and have come back and have come on as full-time hires. Um, IBM Research Africa really prides itself on being the first industrial research lab on the continent. And now we've got other people joining us as well and saying, oh, there's, there's a lot of people in, in Africa and uh, they can actually do this work here, boots on the ground, and we're seeing these other competitors come to the space and we, we like that, we enjoy that. We, are, we really wanna make it clear that a reason IBM Research Africa is here in Nairobi, in Johannesburg is because of the presence of talent and what we can do to help grow that talent and uh, attract it in uh, from overseas as well. Okay, all right, that's, that's the, the bit of the background of the history of why is the lab there, what research is doing. Um, now I wanna go through a few slides that give examples of some of the partnerships that we've had um, over the course of the last seven to eight years or so. And I'm gonna start with the generic one because everyone sort of assumes that IBM is 
the tech partner of banks and telcos, and it's true. Uh, we, we do service, we provide a lot of the technology that uh, banks use in their backend offices and how telcos store and receive their data. Uh, and so one of our early projects is working with a bank and telco partner in Nairobi, Kenya. And this was early days. This is before credit scoring really took off as an app-based system. Uh, and they wanted to use cell phone usage and mobile money in order to create a credit score for an individual. It's common now. It was not common back in 2015 or 2016 when this project really started taking off. Uh, we developed a tr uh, credit scoring model uh, using machine learning, boosted trees in particular. We trained it on Kenya data and we deployed it as a product in Uganda. So some cool stuff using transfer learning in order to train in one domain and apply in another was some of the science behind the scenes. Uh, but this was a, an example of a kind of a for-profit and for-profit institution coming together in Nairobi and using a data science approach in order to develop a new product. So we're really happy with uh, this engagement. Uh, and it was kind of using our, you know, more or less traditional engagements contract style setup. Uh, we've also uh, worked with startups. Uh, two that come to mind is a startup called uh, Twig of Foods based in Nairobi. Um, they supply agricultural goods. So think about your basic uh, fruits, vegetables, uh, and they're the, they're the supply chain. They're the ones that bring it up from the rural areas, bring it into the urban areas for, for selling. And we wanted to introduce credit into that supply chain, into that supply chain system. And we did so um, using a blockchain based system. Uh, for another startup, Hello Tractor, we outfitted some of their tractors with sensors so that while the tractors were out um, uh, plowing their fields, we could collect a lot more data that was used for mapping out the, their actual paths as well as some maintenance properties. And so this was a, another project with a bit of a startup. So on the kind of for-profit side, we work with large companies and we've also had projects with smaller startups as well. Governments. Um, IBM also has had projects with different forms of governments. Here we can see one that was with the larger government of Kenya, a smaller project within just the Nairobi County government. And then we've also worked with some of the more rural area governments on a project funded by USAID. Um, Charity actually led this project with the government of Kenya. The World Bank releases an ease of doing business ranking, which ranks all the countries of the world about how easy it is to set up a business, uh, how to get different licenses and um, things needed as according to the government's regulations. Kenya was not in a good spot. She's got the actual numbers, but it was pretty poor. And so uh, a part of a team of researchers from the uh, Nairobi lab evaluated that workflow, really asked questions about, is this step necessary? Does this, does this poor, you know, form really need to go through two different stamping processes and they streamlined that workflow. And um, Kenya's rank increased, I wanna say like 80 spots over the last two years, but I'll let Charity comment on that one. Uh, but that was again, a pretty straightforward engagement be between IBM Research and the government of Kenya. Um, we've also done a project where we added monitors to garbage collectors, so waste collection trucks, and then mapped out the paths that they did through the city and used it to evaluate traffic and road quality. So that was a bit of a, an interesting experience uh, working with a smaller form of the government at the county level. Uh, last but not least, I put the USAID on this list because it is kind of a form of government-ish funding, but through a donor. And this was used to monitor boreholes in rural arid Kenya and create a dashboards so that people can monitor the status of if it was working or not, or if repairs were needed uh, at an individual borehole level. Uh, so again, projects that involved in this case is multiple stakeholders, most of them on this slide with a kind of a government's governance angle. Uh, we've had a long relationship with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And so this slide, they get one all of themselves. Uh, we've done this over the course of about three years, I believe the Gates Foundation and IBM work together. Uh, and some of these conversations are now continuing uh, to unfold. We looked at the best ways to intervene for malaria with interventions being things like distribution of bed nets or where and how much money you should spend on spraying insecticides for mosquito eggs. 
Um, we've done a causal analysis on birth control. Um, when people would when women would discontinue birth control, Gates Foundation really wanted to understand why that happened. And so there was some causal analysis tricks done in that survey data. We also spent time trying to understand what vulnerable meant, the word vulnerable in the lens of maternal newborn child health. So there was a, a quote of, you know, I can't define vulnerability, but I know it when I see it, you know, playing off the famous quote of pornography. And so they were asking us to try to, you know, capture this idea from a data point of view. What does it mean to have vulnerable? Why do we have these higher uh, maternal and newborn uh, mortality rates? Why do we have uh, stunted growth and development challenges? Uh, and so that was a project spanning for two or three years that developed some new computer science methods that we're still using today. Uh, and last on this list, one that I just concluded uh, earlier this year, uh, we worked with Makerere University based out of Uganda to study how the COVID-19 uh, pandemic impacted more traditional healthcare access. So they had all this temporal data about access to healthcare and you can see changes that COVID-19 had, not necessarily on the outcomes yet, but just on how people are accessing healthcare. And so this was again a, a project for working a bit closer with Macaria University, uh, but funded by the Gates Foundation to try to understand access to healthcare um, throughout the pandemic. Uh, so we've also had strong relationships with external, external donors and the Gates Foundation is probably the, our, our largest example of that uh, within IBM Research Africa. Last but not least, and then we'll get to your all questions for charity. I'll be here just to coordinate after that point. Um, the universities. Uh, so we probably our strongest relationship is with Witts University based in Johannesburg. And uh, the a primary driver of that is actually our Johannesburg lab is on their campus um, in South Africa. And so just having that physical proximity allows so much more interactions between faculty and students and our researchers. So uh, I think a takeaway we can have from this, although technology is amazing, physical proximity just is really hard to replicate. And so having that co-location has strengthened our relationship with this university in ways that we have not had in lots of other university relationships on the continent. Um, more specific to this particular call, Vitz University are leading on two of the large hubs called Mediva and Heat. And IBM Research are then sub-awardees on each of those two programs. So I think, again, physical proximity being there allow those relationships to grow over time. And that's now turned to us being strong partners on the larger DSI grant. We also have a relationship with Vitz University based off of a quantum network. So we're trying to build up relationship with multiple universities to give their researchers and students access to IBM quantum computing. Uh, so I think that's still in the early stages and it's, I think it's changing kind of a, on, a, on a regular basis, but we're trying to see what um, Africa-based researchers can do if given access to a quantum computer and Vitz was one of the leaders in that particular network. Um, I, can't, I can't go on and talk about more universities without mentioning Carnegie Mellon University, Africa. Uh, disclaimer, I am also a, a CMU grad, and so I've, I've just loved uh, interacting with the students as interns and both as hires. I would say uh, probably CMU Africa, I think, forms our largest hiring base for um, our research engineers at the Kenya Lab, and that spans uh, Kenyans, uh, Nigerians, Ethiopians, uh, quite a range uh, nationalities represented there that come through that channel. Uh, we are in the process of trying to actually formalize a relationship with CMU Africa, uh, but right now it's just been a strong, consistent relationship of internships and hires. And we do want to see uh, that relationship grow and we're, we're in uh, ongoing conversations for that. Um, and then actually this last one is something I had mentioned earlier. We worked with Macarera University um, with the Gates Foundation project of trying to understand the impact of COVID-19 and how that changed access to healthcare within Uganda. Um, so all of these are to basically give examples of profit, NGOs, government relationships, uh, startups, and a bit of university relationships uh, about how IBM Research Africa engages with the stakeholders in its kind of immediate area. 
Um, IBM Research Global, of course, has partnerships around the globe. Uh, and part of uh, Charity's job now as director is to really push forward on some of these existing relationships or find new ones and look for these strategic partners. And again, they can span academia, profit, governments, or donors um, that will allow our researchers to have you know, the impact that they came to work for IBM Research Africa for. They, their goal is still to kind of address Africa's grand challenges we need to be a bit smarter about it and be clear on what is aligning with IBM research's agenda. And those are things like generative models for drug discovery, generative models for climate, and how we can use large language models for the enterprise. Those are very clearly spoken goals from the larger IBM business unit that says, you guys need to work on this space. Generative AI is here to stay. And I, I agree with that. What does that mean now in the context of partnerships in Africa? That's on charity's plate. So I'm, I'm, I'm doing this now as part of a transition to the, uh, the question and answer session here. And so this is my last slide. This is not a questions if you have them. Uh, please, we will start calling on people if there are not questions being asked. Um, and I want to kind of reintroduce charity once again as the director of IBM Research Africa. And she has been kind of handling this, this question of what does effective partnerships look like in the context of here on the African continent, but keeping in mind the larger goals and trends of, of data science and machine learning research around the globe. So I think it's a really cool job, a tough job. Uh, and um, she's here now, maybe, I don't know, Charity, I, two minute introduction and tell me all of the engagements that I missed on the last couple slides. Cause I'm sure whenever you see them, you're gonna say he didn't say X, Y, or Z. Uh, but Charity, just uh, two minutes, two minutes. I'll count them down. Then you do want to spend <laughs> all right. Right. Um, um, Hi everyone. And thank you so much for your attention and invitation. Um, as Skyla said, um, the director for IBM Research Africa and um, I do think a lot about partnerships. So maybe rather than what Skyla is asking me to comment on the partnerships that he missed out on, maybe I can just take two minutes to kind of highlight some key lessons that we are all carrying along with us based on the, um, the many different partnerships that we've had. And I think um, a key perspective is to think about um, the fact that we we are private sector, so um, we do bring a particular view into the partnerships that we have. Um, so I'll just highlight maybe um, a couple of lessons, and then I'm hoping that um, it will also spark some more questions. So um, I think one of the key things is making sure that we are quite clear on um, the nature of the collaboration and what each each partner is bringing. I think it's um, the reason I bring this up is particularly when you have different stakeholders that have um, different goals. And um, so the way we've, the lessons we've learned is really making sure that um, in this idea of mutual collaboration is we don't have the same strengths, but each person is bringing a strength to the collaboration. Um, one, you know, and I'm just highlighting them so that I can open up more opportunity for questions. So I, I won't go into specific examples for each. Um, a second one is really articulating and um, having a plan for how you address um, what I call translation challenges, particularly when you're bringing in um, stakeholders from completely different fields that can be um, very stark language or fluency challenges because everyone comes from a different perspective and you know one joke I I I heard um the other day is when we talk about AI if you're in tech you're very clearly thinking about um artificial intelligence if you are in agriculture you're clearly thinking about artificial insemination and so you can have this discussion using these acronyms and you're having very different discussions so at a much more um, detailed level, you really have to think about that. Um, I think really defining success for each of the stakeholders. And I would say particularly in the, um, in the collaborations we've had with 
um, for example, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, you know, the donor world in general, I should say, or in um, especially working with government, I think it's very important to articulate that because sometimes for us as researchers, we're very fascinated with the fact that we want to build the most innovative, the most interesting, you know, where we can show our technical um, prowess or advancements in technology because that's how research is measured. Whereas perhaps someone in, um, in government or in the donor world is really very focused on um, how do I make sure that whatever you're building can be scaled, it can be adopted into the by a community of practice. So really being clear and finding where those align so that you, you everyone has their expectations met um, and uh, you're clear on that. Um, maybe two more and then I will, I will stop. I think it's particularly in the work that we did with government that Skyla was highlighting. Um, great value in um, defining or finding champions and visionaries who can articulate the problems you're jointly collaborating in ways that are meaningful for each of the stakeholders. So in this work that Skylar described, um, you know, we're literally changing government processes and um, re-engineering them and, and digitizing. And if, you know, maybe in tech, we think that's cool and exciting. Um, for a typical government employee, you know, there's no sense of urgency about, for many, there's no sense of urgency about why it needed to get done so quickly. So um, there had to be a language about how we set the vision, what is the potential impact of this thing on employment, on our ranking as a country, on our competitiveness as a country. And um, it sort of helped to get everyone on board. Um, obviously, being able to understand the challenge, um, anticipate the challenges that you might face in the collaboration um, and starting to institutionalize certain things so that um, the collaborations live beyond the individuals who crafted the, um, the partnerships. Um, so let me pause there and I'm hoping that at least that kind of tells you some of the things that we think about. Um, and then I'd be more than happy to take questions. I will perhaps, I think we're doing great on time. I think we did kind of want to leave about 20 minutes for question and answer. So we've been through the agenda items and um, uh, again, through just uh, some examples. And I think so far we've heard about the, the importance of having um, clear alignment on all sides, again, whether it's government or or, or private uh, for-profit companies, what the alignment goals are and why people on each side of the engagement should really be involved. And then uh, Charity also mentioned a really in important part about having those champions on both sides that can really keep the vision going. Um, without some of those key players, even, you know, even the tightest, you know, contracts or engagements or those types of situations, they, they, they can really start to fall and falter. Um, so um, yes, please. I know we've got a very, very diverse crowd on the, on the, uh, on the chat. Lots of introductions there from different areas. Um, uh, if people don't mind either on chat or, uh, uh, you know, unmuting and, and asking questions. Charity uh, again has been doing this, studying this space uh, for multiple years now. Um, uh, yes, there is a recording, Andrew. It is being recorded right now. Um, so there are two questions in the chat already. Um, yes. So one from Inet, if I'm pronouncing correctly, says, says, thank you. It's great to hear about your activities at IBM Research Africa. Are there any specific opportunities available for PhD students that are utilizing AI to enhance healthcare? Um, and it's at the International Foundation Against Infectious Disease in Nigeria. That's one, maybe I can just add the other. Um, how do you choose from John? How do you choose or do due diligence to bring on partners, any specific things, maybe also criteria, I suppose, yeah. So those are the two so far. Excellent. Um, so thank you for the questions. Um, there was the first one on, um, opportunities for PhD students um, utilizing AI to enhance healthcare. 
Um, yes, and here's the examples of opportunities I'll provide. So one, of course, there are internships that um, we have annually where they can come in and be part of IBM research. Um, the second one uh, is more from an institutional perspective rather than individuals, because then, you know, it's difficult to just have individuals uh, where you have to have an agreement, et cetera, et cetera. So um, we've had, for example, uh, um, some work with or a program with the World Bank where they sponsor some um, internship, um, sorry, they sponsor PhD students. And so we had a program with them where they could send some of their interns to work with us. Um, but it's it's not as easy when you're just looking at individuals because there's a, there has to be an agreement, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we like to have it from a perspective of an, you know, an institutional agreement um, for situations where it's not just a simple internship. Um, the question on um, due diligence to bring on partners, um, there are two levels on the due diligence part. There's obvious, the part that the organization does to look at, you know, the partner, what's their history? Do they comply with all of the, you know, IBM requirements? That for every institution, you know, are they on the US denied parties list, et cetera, they will look at that. And then the other part is more of a strategic alignment um, conversation. So it's asking, um, you know, what is the mutual benefit in working together? Because as Skylar earlier on described, we are an industrial research um, institution. And so we do, we have a very strong, um, goal in being able to develop technologies that will benefit IBM. And we do work on in collaborations sometimes to, to do that. So when we look at the partner, it will be a question about what are they trying to advance? Is that aligned to our strategy? Um, you know, what will the collab what's the nature of the collaboration? What will we be, will we be able to do um, together? You know, where will the funding for the program, all of that fun stuff. But it really starts with the strategic alignment um, part of things. Um, and the strategic alignment is really about what are the areas that IBM wants to advance technology in? And in working on this collaboration, is that going to help us to do that? So that becomes a huge filter of some of the work that we do. Now, we have a lot of tools that, um, we have provided that are open source and available for anyone to use, where we also find that we may not be working on a particular use case, but we can point individuals to those tools so that they can leverage them and continue um, to work on them. Uh, I'm gonna do a quick run through on some more questions that are coming up here. Uh, um, Joseph had asked if we're doing, if IBM is doing any work on digital health. Uh, and the answer is yes, and maybe so on the yes case, we actually are actively engaged with the NIH data DSI program um, through the Mediva and heat hubs. And those areas very much are looking at collections of digital health records at the population level. Some are looking, heat is looking at more of a maternal newborn child health outcomes as relates to climate, more particular temperature. And Mediva is looking at the unfortunate increase in multimorbidity in sub-Saharan African populations. And so these, these are things like your heart disease, diabetes, um, hypertension. Those areas are unfortunately increasing among African populations as well. So yes, we do work in that space. However, in the timeline between when DSI started and we're doing these engagements, um, IBM Research Africa, I chaired had mentioned the importance of understanding each partner's kind of direction and goals. From a healthcare point of view, I think, I not think, IBM Research Africa and the larger IBM research is focusing on how we can use generative technologies for ex um, accelerating drug discovery. And so that's been kind of a loud and clear statement on here. And I think it might be a pretty strong pivot to say, now we're gonna go into the kind of that population healthcare space after IBM Research Africa has said, we're working on drug discovery. This is not meant to shoot anyone's ideas down, but it's more to emphasize the importance of understanding why these different partners come into play. 
Uh, and I think that's kind of, so I want to emphasize that both as one of our previous learnings of saying, I think drug discovery really is important and generally technologies. Oh. So, Skyler, maybe maybe switch your camera off. You're breaking up a bit. So, while while I'm chatting to while Skyler sorts out his connection, I was wondering, um, just to perhaps add to the the discussion about drug drug discovery, um, I was wondering if there was any if it's new dr drug discovery, or is it also repurposing of drugs? Just wanted to ask that. Uh, okay. Uh, am yeah. I am I breaking up? Yes. yes. My one has to uh, uh, up I see. Sky. Uh, um. Let me just send him a message. Um. Sure. Uh, so the, the quite a lot of questions yeah. coming through. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So so maybe what I'll what I'll yeah. in response to your question on healthcare, um. The part that we've kind of um, moved our strategy as an organization is to focus more on technology and less on the particular use case. And so when we build a technology, we will it will have multiple applications in different areas. There are a few areas that we have chosen for um, how we, you know, how we, we demonstrate um, a particular technology. So for example, there's a ton of work that we've developed, we've done in terms of developing AI tools for analyzing data in general. Okay. Um, they are applicable in many different fields. So the work that Skylar was describing that we're collaborating today on the Madiva project is tools that were not that were built um, to begin with, not necessarily targeting the specific use case that um, we are working on in, in Madiva but there are AI tools that enable you to, uh, to analyze data. The specific use case becomes an example to, uh, to validate or to demonstrate that this technology works. So in the drug discovery area, what we've actually developed is that we're developing a, some generic toolkits that, that advance or accelerate um, how you discover materials. And the way we think about it is there's an aspect of huge data sets that require fancy computation to do this. Then there is AI tools that help you to analyze the data. And then of course there are other, you know, quantum, et cetera. So when we bring this together, um, we are developing technologies that would be quite, um, let me call it generic for lack of a better word. But the idea is now you can use that thinking to apply to a particular area. So for example, for um, drug discovery, back to your question about discovery versus repurposing, the idea actually is that we can learn from lots of data sets that tell us about drugs. So one example is if I can look at lots and lots of examples of um, drug, chemical structures of drugs and I can, sort of tie, connect that or build models that can connect the structure to certain properties, then one I can, a use case I can do for that is I can develop or predict a new molecule and see what the characteristics of that molecule might be. Two, I can take a molecule and if now I know molecules and sort of their targets, I can maybe look at existing drugs and say, can they be reused for something? Three, I can also use it and say, can I predict um, the toxicity of drugs or off-target um, um, off um, reactivity of different drug molecules? So lots of different applications, but the base technology is quite similar. And so even on the question on population health, for me, it's the same thing. We build technologies to analyze data. As you chat with people and they define a specific use case, maybe in population health, we can look and say, hey, here's a technology that can be customized to help you to address that challenge. Awesome. I think we have Skylar back as well. <laughs> um, maybe uh, you can take this quick questions I was asking about, can 
we access um, IBM computer platforms for researchers. So is there, yeah, is there probably a platform that people can sign up to? Maybe Mtaiki can speak up if he wants to. He's from WITS, he or she. Yeah. Um, so accessing IBM computing platforms, is, is there such a thing? Um, yeah. Um, I think I would I would answer this that yes, but in the context of a collaboration. So um, it's not an, an like open for anyone um, just because these do cost. Um, but in the context of a collaboration where you articulate it, then it's possible to do that. Um, also, we've had a number of um, collaborations, especially on the quantum side where universities have come together and um, and uh, like subscribed to a quantum um, subscription system and therefore all of these universities together can access. So what I would say is, um, Mtakai, maybe we can have a specific conversation later on what, when you say computing platforms, what are you looking to accomplish? Um, because we also do provide some um, computational resources using our, a skills build platform that are specifically targeted to um, people in academia. So we, I, I can put you in touch with um, our university relations program where we do provide cloud credits, um, a bunch of other resources specifically for research purposes in the university. So, um, Chanet, it seems like lots of folks want to connect with you. Do you ever have, I mean, besides like this session, do you ever have um, sort of an open house or a session where you host as IBM yeah. able to hop on and, and have a chat with you? Because it looks like lots of people are asking, do you come in as, in as an industry partner or do you come in as a research partner? Do you yeah. work on genomics? There's a lot of questions about partnering yeah. with IBM. And as Kyla said, there are specific um, fields or specific topics that IBM is focusing on based on grand yeah. challenge, narrow, yeah. narrowed down by what IBM is you know, part of the agenda and so on. Um, yeah, so maybe do you, do you ever have sessions like that? Um, yes, we do. Maybe not as often as we should, but yes, we do. Um, you know, so um, I'm trying to think about how to articulate it. So we've been working with some organizations just to sort of invite people into our space and say, this is what we are doing. Here's what we can highlight. We've invited a number of um, universities to come and visit if they would like, or they write to us and we just say, hey, come in. So that's one. Um, the other part, I think, is for people that want to have specific conversations, we also try our best to be responsive to email. Um, so if they reach out and want to have a very specific discussion on a topic, then we're happy to do that as well. Um, maybe I can look at, I see maybe one question on the implementation versus research. Um, so maybe the comment I'll make there is when you're an industrial research organization, um, there always has to be some level of implementation because our goal is not just knowledge creation. As Skylar had mentioned, a major goal for us is to make sure that we are creating either new capabilities for our business or new technologies that will become pro you know, fully fledged businesses. So as part of that, we have to build and test the solutions that we're um, researching on with um, and validate them with partners. Now, for example, the work on reengineering processes, we also had to think about how we transition some of our skills to the government so that it doesn't end with just the funding. Um, but there's a lot of thinking and work in figuring out for many things, research projects, implementation projects, how do they have a life post the funded part of the um of the of the project um i'll just try and see if there's another question i can quickly give an answer to um how much of the research output is targeted to africa market that's from anthony um so the reason for being based in africa even though we're part of a global organization is to make sure that in the things that have been defined as a strategy for the organization, that we can also find 
ways in which those will be meaningful for the African continent. So I'll tell you, for example, a lot of the work that um, in healthcare, the drug discovery um, goals that Skyland, I think I just highlighted a few minutes ago, um, the way we, we are finding applications into the African context is by saying, why don't we leverage these technologies to develop a drug that would be targeting um, NTDs? So um, drugs that, sorry, diseases, uh, the neglected tropical diseases. So that's a very Africa specific um, drug discovery challenge, um, but it's gonna be using technology that can be used anywhere in the world, right? It's just that the specific use case or articulation of it will have meaningful impact here. For the work that we're doing with um, climate and sustainability, again, has applications everywhere, but very specific examples um, where we work with partners here for that reason. Um, so the conversations we're having with the government of Kenya, where we're saying, how do we use IBM technology that we're developing for um, nature, you know, to quantify how much carbon is planted in trees, uh, is sequestered in trees, because that's a goal that they have. How do we use that to manage floods, which are becoming a big deal in the continent due to climate change. So the onus is actually on us as researchers in the two labs to say, if this is the global strategy, how do we articulate that in a way that's meaningful for our environment? Because unfortunately, that application to the African market is not going to come from somewhere, someone somewhere else. This is why we have been placed into the environment. Um, that, that sounds really awesome. I like the the, the um, agenda, the IBM agenda. While it uses so sort of those technologies from that you develop throughout your your organization, you can apply it locally to serve African people. And it is comforting because we do know there is a big gap between what's happening in AI in Africa and what's happening in AI elsewhere. We've got a lot of catching up to do, and it's great to create those. Um, you know, applications that are going to solve real problems and not just the nice to have stuff. So um, there's a lot of questions here. And I think what, what we can do is we're going to, we're going to pull these questions. I'm not pulling, but pull them from the, the chat and maybe share it with charity and, and, and Skyla and see what we haven't um, answered and maybe share with the group those answers. And, and, and there's an email there for Skyla and an email for charity. You can reach out to them and they'll try to get back to you. Um, yes, so this has really been a great um, discussion. I don't know if Skyla wants to have a last word and then I'll hand over to Francis. Thank you so much. I'm not sure whether we still have Skylar on. Yeah, we do. Yeah, I said he's muted. Oh, yeah. <laughs> because he dropped. Sorry, Skylar. That, that must be <laughs> difficult for him. <laughs> yeah, but we, we have um, um, one minute left. So um, I wanted to personally um, thank Skylar and Charity for, for making time to engage us in this discussion. Um, I did put the link to sign up to the DS Africa Partnership and Outreach Working Group in the chat, and I'm putting it there again. I see people have already started subscribing to the working group, and then you will be added to the working group mailing list. Um, our next meeting is on um, August 21st. Yeah, we do have our meetings on the third Mondays of every month. Our next meeting is on August 21st. So those who subscribe, we will add you to our project spaces and then we send calendar invites for you. Thank you so much. The recording will be made available on the DS Africa YouTube channel as always. And um, there'll be a follow up email to you all regarding the, the recording. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of the day. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.